Hello, good afternoon, happy Nevada day, and welcome to another Sundance Books and Music live stream. My name is Emily, I'm the assistant manager here, and I am so happy to introduce David Anthony Durham, whose new book, The Shadow Prince, is available now at the store and on our website, sundancebookstore.com. If you have any questions for David during today's live stream, please leave them in the comments on the YouTube page, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the discussion. David Anthony Durham is a Caribbean writer born in New York and raised primarily in the Mid-Atlantic area. He holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Maryland and has taught at the University of Maryland, the University of Massachusetts, the Colorado College, the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation, Cal State University, Hampshire College, and University of Nevada, Reno. David is the author of Seven Books for Grownups, and this is his first book for middle grade readers. Please join me in welcoming David Anthony Durham. Hello, and thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, and hi, folks who are out there. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm thrilled to be doing a Sundance event. I've been to them before and always loved the enthusiasm um, and the community that Sundance creates. It's virtual this time, but I'm hoping that means some folks are here who might not have been otherwise. Um, I love it that the back of the book, or the, the jacket material for the book says, um, you know, kind of, yeah, he did some seven books for grownups, but now there's like, you know, something real uh, for kids. Um, that's wonderful. I'm really enjoying being in this space now. So, um, I'm, yes, I'm here to talk about uh, this first middle grade novel of mine and to read from it a bit. It's called The Shadow Prince. And the main things I think you need to know um, are that uh, the setting is a magical, fantastical, solar powered ancient Egypt. Um, and the protagonist is a boy named Ash. He doesn't know who his parents are or what's happened to them. He's been raised by a mentor far out in a desert, uh, in, a, in, a, in a small village. All his young life, he's uh, been trained by his mentor, Yazin, in fighting techniques and acrobatic skills and lessons in, on history and demon lore and reading and writing hieroglyphics, hieroglyphs. Um, and he's never really understood why. Yazin doesn't let him use any of these skills and none of them really provide anything for his village life. On the eve of his 12th birthday, he learns that all this is training, training has been for the opportunity to become the shadow to a prince of Egypt. That is uh, the bodyguard, a lifelong friend, ally and confidant um, to uh, a prince in this case. He'll have to compete with other boys and girls with the same birth date um, through dangerous tests and lots of demon fighting, stuff like that. And when he first hears about this, you know, on the eve of his, of his 12th birthday, he doesn't really believe it. Um, so there's that. I'm going to read from relatively um, near the beginning of the novel. Um, the first scene isn't Ash, actually. It's gonna, a, a short one from the point of view of the antagonist of the novel. He's a rather sour god who is intent on making sure that none of the ca candidates to be the shadow make it through the testing. And after that, we'll join Ash as he's waiting on the morning. He's been told he'll be summoned to the Capitol for all this stuff to begin. So that's what I'm aiming to do. And pull it up. Um, okay, I guess I'll just go ahead and start. <clears throat> this is chapter five, The Gathering of Demons. Deep in the Duat, and far from Ash's humble village, a very annoyed Egyptian god stood in a gathering of demons. The god was Lord Set, and he didn't much like demons. In close quarters like the dank underworld cavern he was in now, the creatures were even more unpleasant than usual. Their monster shapes crowded the stone chamber, each one of them more beastly than the next. Jaws and claws, growing, glowing eyes and fur and scales and horns. There was no end to the to the disgusting shapes they took. Set was grateful that at least the light was dim with only a faint reddish glow. Even his sharp eyes couldn't see them that well. The rank smell of the creatures was almost too much to bear. 
a mixture of pungent sweat and foul armpit odor and other things Set didn't want to think about. Their garble, grumbling and grunting would, to most people, have been the stuff of nightmares. Set, however, wasn't most people. He wasn't even a person. He was, in his own opinion, Egypt's foremost god. It annoyed him like nothing else that the other gods didn't acknowledge this. Instead, they had robbed him of his proper place on the throne of the gods and forever punished him for a few small deeds, misdeeds, done ages ago. Youthful mistakes, nothing more. It's been a thousand years, he grumbled. Really, they should get over it. It was terribly unfair, in his opinion, and he had every intention of doing something about it. That's why he called this meeting of demons. It was part of the plan he'd been working toward since Prince Khufu's shadow testing approached. Being demons, and not necessarily the cleverest of creatures, they hadn't all arrived on time. Waiting with them had been a tedious affair, but they were almost all gathered now. There was only one that he was still waiting on. When Set heard the loud reverberating tramp of her footsteps, he knew the time had finally come. Ah, uh, he said, there she is now. Devour us of the dead, how kind you are, kind of you to join us. A huge hulking shape emerged into the chamber, wafting an even greater stink than all the other demons combined. Set held a handkerchief to his snout-like nose and said to the group, you'll want to know why I've summoned you. I have a task for you. The demons increased their garbled grunting. Quiet, this is work you'll like. You've been trapped down here in the depths for far too long. You must all desire to see the world, the living again, to walk among them and do what you do best. Bring terror and misery to the human world. Tell me, how long has it been since you tasted human flesh, young flesh at that? That silenced them. All around him, the demons crept closer, suddenly very interested in what the god had to say. Set grinned, and flames of excitement kindled in his eyes. Let me explain what I have in mind. You'll like this. Oh, I'm sure you'll like it very much. So that's, that's that short chapter, the first intro to Set, who's gonna be a force working against Ash and his friends throughout this entire, entire book. Um, but now let's get to Ash um, as his adventure is about to kick off. This is chapter six, uh, A Village Spectacle. I could have died of embarrassment. Yazan and I stood outside the main en entrance to our compound, right where anybody in the village could see us. He had woken me before sunrise in a flurry of motion, saying the day had finally come. I'd never seen him so full of nervous energy. He kept talking about the decision I was going to make. Would I accept the royal offer and journey to Memphis for the testing, which could result in my death? Or do I say no thanks and settle into a long life in the middle of nowhere? Considering that I'd never been asked to decide anything about my own fate, it was hard to get my head around the notion that it might all suddenly be up to me. I had moved around half asleep in the early hours that morning, doing the things that needed to be done if we were going to be leaving the compound for a while. By the time I was fully awake, Yazan had packed two satchels worth of clothes and basic supplies. He then led us to the compound gate, closed it behind us, and there we stood, satchels beside us, waiting. Yazan had added a sleeveless shirt to his attire, which for him was downright fancy. He had an orange cloth wrapped around his head, protection from the sun, which was pretty important when you're bald in Egypt. I wished I had a head wrap too. I would tried to comb the knots out of my hair, but it had just made them lumpy in a different way. I shrugged, what did it matter? I was still convinced we weren't going anywhere. The sun bloomed on the horizon and crept upward. It was going to be hot, but that was no surprise. Yazin bent forward and said a prayer to Lord Ra, asking for his blessing. Give the boy the wisdom and courage to make the right decision, he said. Lord Ra, by which I mean the sun, didn't have anything to say in response. He just hung there in the sky like he did every day. Yasin, I asked, what are we doing? Waiting for the royal barge to arrive. I smirked. I could see for miles in every direction. I didn't see any royal barge. Nothing was happening out there 
except for the heat waves starting to ripple on the horizon. A few vultures circled in the, in the blue sky. None of it looked special or different in any way. It wasn't long before the villagers began to gather around us. The local strongman was the first to arrive. He dropped the sack of grain he'd been carrying. Stretching the bulky muscles of his back, he asked, So, what's this? You two going somewhere? Perhaps, Yasmin said. Perhaps. A little later, the old storyteller happened by. Leaning on his cane, he said, Old friend, do I see the makings of a story here? Yazan kept his gaze out on the horizon. Yes, I believe there are makings of a story here. The friendly, round baker woman who made flaky pastries joined the other two. She squinted at us for a moment and then asked, Yazan, you old fool, where are you going? Perhaps nowhere, or... I'd always suspected that Yazan admired more about the baker woman than her pastries, and I could see that he was tempted to say something more. Don't do it, I thought. I almost stepped on his toe. I should have, because after a moment of hesitation, he finished. Perhaps to the Pharaoh's palace. Ash is to be a candidate for the office of the Prince of Shadow. I groaned. He'd said it. Word of that would spread faster than stink among pigs. Sure enough, within minutes, the entire village, young and old, stood staring at us. They peppered Yazan and me with questions. Yazan answered cryptically, which just made them more interested. I kept my mouth shut. This had the potential to make me the butt of jokes for years to come. I could hear it already. Remember that time crazy Yazin and Ash got sunstroke waiting for the summons from the Pharaoh? They waited all day and no one came. Then it got worse. Merck, Dowser, Dowser and Setka arrived. They squirmed between the adults until they stood right beside me, too close for comfort. Merck held his sunboard gripped to his chest. A grin tilted his lips and grew as he came to understand the situation. For a time, he didn't say anything. He just stood there, smiling. I itched to back away from him, but there was no, nowhere to back away to. He was near enough that nobody but me heard him whisper, you loser. Nobody's coming to pick you up. You're just a canal can can rat, can rat, a nobody. You will be all your life. I'll never let you forget it. He pulled away, spun around, and pointed into the distance. Hey, look, he said with sudden excitement. Is that a sun barge? It's coming for you, Ash. Seven, a tale to tell. Is it? Dowser sounded genuinely surprised. He stood on tiptoes to see. Where? Setka asked. I don't see it. I couldn't tell if his buddies were playing dumb or just being dumb, but I knew what Merck was doing. A joke, that's what it was. He glanced at me grinning mischievously. To the others, he said, no, it's out there. I've got really good eyes. Just watch and wait, you'll see. You'd think everybody in the village would know Merck by now. The kids he tormented and teased did, but somehow the adults never seemed to see him for the bully he was. They waited, scanning the horizon. I even felt Yazan stand a little straighter and lift his chin. I half wanted to let him in on the joke, but I didn't have the energy. I hung my head. Don't you see it? Mark asked. He was enjoying himself. A whole royal barge coming all the way out here just to get Ash because he's so, I see it, Setka shouted. For a moment, I thought he'd finally caught on and was adding to the hilarity. But when the baker woman said, oh my, yes, I believe you're right. That brought my head up. Huh? Mark asked. Everyone hushed. We all strained to see. I climbed up on the satchel, gripping Yazan's arm for support. At first, I didn't see anything other than the squiggly lines that rippled across the horizon. And then something appeared. It was blurry at first, just a shimmering where there shouldn't be a shimmering. It's a sun barge, the storyteller said. My eyes are old, but I know the shape. Of course it is, Yazan said. Uh, it's just passing. Merck said. He didn't sound as pleased with himself as he had a moment ago. I didn't notice if anybody, I didn't know if anybody had noticed that he'd changed his tune. I had to admit, though, there was a good chance he was right. We'd all seen sun barges passing in the desert, sailing majestically in the distance, but they never came to our village. Where would they? No, 
It's coming this way, the strong man said. Of course it is, Yasin said. For the first time, I thought he might be right. Amazingly, the billowing, glistening solar sails seemed to be heading toward us. Instead of being filled with wind like, nor like a normal sail, the fabric swelled with solar power, glowing with light and energy. The vessel grew larger and more distinct every moment as it floated above the desert. Below its sails hung an ornate, wonderful ship swaying in the air currents. It really was a sun barge and it was heading straight for us. The closer it got to our village, the faster it seemed to move. It ate up the desert at incredible speed, so fast that I began to think it was gonna sail right over us. The air around it buzzed with insect life. Even from a distance, I could tell they weren't normal insects like those we had in the village. They were much bigger. Wide-winged dragonflies flew in military formations, darting to change position every now and then. Large scarab beetles wheeled about in front of the prow, dipping and rising like river dolphins before a waterborne vessel. Still, other beetles crawled across the hull, busy with jobs I couldn't figure out. At the last minute, the largest of the sun sails disappeared and the vessel slowed. Smaller sails were pulled in one at a time as the massive ship touched down, light as a feather, at the edge of the village. Figures appeared on the railing, peering down at us from on high. We must have looked a sad sight. Everyone in the village, including me, stood staring up at them. Merck had let go of his sunboard and didn't seem to notice it floated near his feet. Dowser's mouth hung open. Setka kept blinking and blinking as if he thought his eyes were playing tricks on him. Two giant dragonflies carved out of the side of the barge with loud thrumming wings. Each carried a soldier sitting in a harness. They swept down so quickly that we all cowered back, making space for them to land. Their six slender legs touched down on the sand and flexed beneath the weight of their bodies. One of the soldiers, a muscle-bound guy with a stern face, surveyed us silently. The other soldier was a woman. She was lean, but looked plenty tough. She gripped a long spear like she knew how to use it. Soon after, a beetle, whose whirring wings seemed to barely keep it afloat, descended from the ship. It flew in an erratic weave, making its way to the space between the dragonfly riders. When it landed, it stood as tall as a person, upright on its two spindly lower legs. Its four other arms moved freely about. One held a board with a sheet of papyrus clipped to it. Another held a writing stylus with which it made, it was marking something on the parchment. The beetle surveyed us from behind two discs of dark glass, shading his eyes from the sun. His insectile features gave no sign of what he might be thinking about the motley array of villagers in front of him. He spoke in a haughty, clicking voice. Who among you is Ash, the shadow candidate? And who is his mentor? He checked his scroll, Yazim by name. Chapter eight, the contract. You heard me correctly, he spoke. Never in my life had I seen a human-sized talking beetle nor giant dragonflies that people could ride, ride on. I hadn't even seen, seen a rural barge from up close. Our village was just a small spot in the middle of nowhere. Yet, there they all were, standing right in front of us. I was dumbfounded. Fortunately, Yazan wasn't. I am Yazan, and this, he said, indicating me, is Ash the shadow candidate. The beetle's eyes fell on me. With one arm, he adjusted his glasses. His mouth part shifted around for a moment and then settled down. I had no idea how to interpret that. Was I disappointing? I didn't have a fancy kilt to wear or any jewelry and my sandals were worn thin. In pretty much every way, I was an average village kid. Was I what the beetle and these soldiers expected of one of these shadow candidates? I couldn't tell, but it seemed unlikely. I'm Lieutenant Rook of the Royal Army Beetle Corps, he said, here on the Pharaoh's business. This shadow candidate, has he been trained in accordance with the tradition? He has, Yazan said. Is he here before me willingly? Yazan looked at me. I shrugged. Y yeah, I guess. The beetle studied me, studied me a moment. Are you ready to sign the contract? contract? 
One of his arms produced another scroll. He snapped it open. A roll of papyrus with hieroglyphs etched all over it poured out. Holding it up to where I could see it, the lieutenant said, you'll find it covers all the standard details, hazards, responsibilities, funeral arrangements. Read over it if you'd like. He thrust it at me. My eyes scanned the pictographs, but there were so many. And on and on. I'd never be able to stand there reading the whole thing. Certain glyphs did jump out at me. Dismemberment, inevitable carnage, likely evisceration. I didn't know what that meant, but it didn't sound good. Ready to sign? Lieutenant Brooke asked. He held the stylus out to me. But I don't understand it all. The beetle clicked. It's just standard legal jargon. It says that you agree to all the terms and conditions of the shadow testing. You understand the risk of bodily harm and death is great, that few candidates survive the testing and so forth. You swear that you want nothing more than to succeed and that if you do, you'll be a loyal servant to the royal family for all your days. Those are the broad strokes at least. Ready to sign? He slipped the stylus into my fingers. Holding the scroll in one hand and the stylus in the other, I hesitated. Was I ready to sign? The hugeness of this all dropped on me at once. This was really happening. All the years of training had actually been in preparation for something. It shamed me to think that I'd ever doubted Yasin. It also frightened me to death to imagine what might be ahead of me. Would I really be expected to fight demons? Would I need knife throwing skills and advanced martial arts techniques? If so, was I ready? I'd always wanted to be far from the village. I wanted to be someplace important, doing important things. But now that it was offered to me, I wasn't sure I was up for it. What if I failed? What if I wasn't special? I was only a village canal, canal rat after all. Maybe they just make fun of me in the city. That reminded me of Mark. I looked at him and at Dowser and Setka. They were staring at me, expressions of dumb astonishment on their faces. I didn't know what awaited us in Memphis, but I knew that if I let this opportunity pass, I'd regret it all my life. I'd be making exactly, I'd be making myself exactly what Mark said I was, a nobody. If I stayed, his start would come through. We'd grow old in the same town with him reminding me of how I was a nobody every day. I didn't want that. I wanted the chance to be somebody, to do great things, to see the wonders of the kingdom. I might die in the process, but at least I had to try. And besides all that, deep down, I knew this was the only chance I'd have to find out who my parents were. Maybe they were alive and out there somewhere wait, waiting for me. I signed my name on the scroll. When I handed it back to the beetle, I thought I could see amusement on his face. I wasn't sure you had it in you, he said. So be it. Uh, climb aboard. He waved two of his arms at the dragonflies. The sun is strong enough to get the barge back to Memphis before dark if we leave now. But, Merck said, but he didn't seem to know what to follow that with. Yasin picked up my satchel and pushed it into my hands. He lifted his and pulled me forward. As we passed the storyteller, he smiled and said, this is truly a tale to tell. Others agreed. The strong man did a little dance, which was funny considering his enormous bulk. The baker woman squeezed Yasin's arm and told him to look after me. Some of the kids began to chant my name. I felt the dragonfly's eyes on me as I approached. Its wings twitched, twitched, but the rider flicked the reins and it stilled. He extended an arm and hauled me up to the saddle behind him. I began to ask, how do you? The rider snapped the reins. The insect's wings, long wings, strummed to life. As it le leapt, my stomach dropped inside me. The earth fell away. My adventure, however it was gonna turn out, had begun. And yeah, that's where, that's where I'll stop. Um, to come, the, the voyage to the capital and, and yeah, lots of days of, of testing, definite lots of uh, action, demon fighting. Um, and ultimately it leads to a series of days where a new God arrives each day and spirits the candidates off to a different place uh, for a very different style of test each day. Um, yeah. That's very exciting. Yeah.
Thanks. Very cool. Well, thank you for reading. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I do have some questions here. If anyone else watching has questions, go ahead and leave them in the YouTube comments and we'll get to them. Oh, we've got some emoji clap applause <laughs> over in the comments. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, David, why did you decide this time to go with middle grade fiction instead of your usual grown up fiction? <laughs> hmm. um, kind of the backdrop of this is that I. I first began this when I was writing my seventh novel, The Risen, and that's a novel about the Spartacus Rebellion uh, against ancient Rome. And I was having a hard time with that one. Um, I proposed it with enthusiasm, but then I was finding it hard to actually get going and kind of finding my way into the story. Um, so time was passing. Uh, so there's that backdrop to, to suggest that maybe um, I was looking for a distraction. Um, <laughs> But when the distraction came and the idea for this novel came, it's the only, only idea I've ever had where I could just pinpoint the day that this occurred to me. Um, or the, the idea, the concept, the world dropped on me. Uh, I was in Massachusetts at the time and it was a hot summer day. I was home alone. I just mowed the grass, came inside to get a cold drink and sat down on the couch. On the coffee table, there was a small book of Egyptian mythology that my son had borrowed from our neighbor. Um, and I just kind of picked that up and began flipping through it. And probably because of the backdrop of my son being the person who had brought it there and the fact that we had so often um, read middle grade works to them as they were younger and then and then they continued that uh, on their own um, soon after. Um, everything I read about the gods was cast in a, a middle grade sort of light. They all had, or so many of them have odd uh, shape-shifting traits and um, kind of outsized personalities and were worshiped in different ways for different reasons. And it all seemed on that day, although I'd, I'd read plenty of stuff about Egypt in the past and taken a number of courses uh, as, a, as an undergrad um, that were all quite serious, it all seemed kind of comedic that day. And I think I was imagining a little bit like a um, Avatar, The Last Airbender um, mm -hmm. by um, that animated series, but in, a, in an ancient Egypt instead. Uh, so I was very amused. Um, as I sat there. And I think from there, probably what happened next is the kind of creation of, of the magic system. And in that, that and the magic system is that um, Lord Ra, when he joins with the sun um, over each up every day, he doesn't just rain down um, normal, powerful sunlight, um, but also a certain magical um, kind of fills it with, with magic as well. So that's what allows this, um, this ancient Egypt to, to harness solar power for lots of different things like, you know, like the barge um, and the floating basically skateboard that, that Merck is really you know, you know, happy to have and um, you know, kind of showing it off earlier in the book. Um, and, and lots of other things as well. Uh, ways to power the city and, um, and lighting. Um, and most significantly, it also can imbue um, stylus with magic for, for magicians. So they can write spells um, in hieroglyphs um, with the kind of with the magic uh, channeled through the stylus and those spells can, can do things. So that was kind of the, the world. I like that it felt um, inspired by ancient Egypt, but with the solar power angle, there could be a certain modernity to it as well. Um, so that felt fun to play with, as well as um, just being enthusiastic about renewable energy sources and making them, them fun and that they manifest in so many different ways throughout the book. Um, I am not sure how I got around to, to thinking of Ash and the, the shadow um, concept. Um, but somewhere in there, that, that became um, the connection I had. And I, I liked the new 
notion of, of the competition, which you know initially seems pretty cutthroat, and some of the other candidates certainly are um, cutthroat, but it's also a place where Ash makes some really good friends along the way um, who help each other, and and also you know the notion of um, of a leader um, needing needing strong strong friendships and and allies um, and people um, who can mutually su support each other. That was a big part of it too. Um, and initially, uh, well, actually, the very first draft of of the book, um, it was the ch the testing part of it, where the first few chapters, and then after that, there was a different adventure that happened. But um, as I had to shelve that book and go back to the book that I actually had been contracted to write and was taking my my time with. Um, you know, the, the Shadow Prince kind of hung out for a while. And uh, when I returned to it, I felt like, you know, let me just expand the whole testing um, side of this so that um, it can really show a lot of different aspects of Egypt and int introduce, you know, these new gods and a little bit of lore um, with, with, each, with each of them. Um, and and that's, that's what I ended up with. It is the start of a series. Um, two books has, has contracted the the second book and I have mostly written it as well. Um, so That's great. That's exciting. It is. Congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, we do have some questions over here from the audience. So Leanne Howard asks, were there any beloved childhood books of yours that influenced this one? Hmm. Well, I don't, I'll answer that in a slightly different way. I'm not I'm not sure that it influenced this one, but it very much influenced um, my getting to the point of writing writing this book. Um, it influenced the the fact that I learned to love reading and became became a writer at all. So I was a really reluctant uh, reader as a kid. I was a slow reader, always in the lowest reading group in elementary school. And there were a number of issues, I think, that were informing that, including that I was um, in a predominantly white um, elementary school and pretty much always felt was or felt that I was, um, you know, the only, only person of color in the class uh, in my grade each year. And when we did reading, it was always in, in the groups and in the three different reading groups. I was always in the lowest and we would read aloud. And I was a shy kid and that was not gonna be a good way to get me reading. It was always just, um, you know, a chore that caused um, a good bit of anxiety. For some reason though, I, when I went to visit my father in Trinidad, you know, my parents had, had split when I was young and I would spend summers um, or some, some of the summers with him um, in Trinidad, small island, um, on the basically on the equator, very tropical, right off the coast of South America. Um, I one year I went with the Hobbit. I don't know if I sought that book out or if someone put it in my hands or or what. I'm not really sure, but I um, I delved into reading that when my dad would, would go to work, and I remember that there was one day I read thirty pages. And that was a big accomplishment for me, um, amazing. And the next day I read 40 pages. And I think the next day I read 90 pages. And you know, that was kind of, I was amazed. And you know, essentially what was happening there, um, even though I was sitting in a very tropical black and brown country on the equator, I fell into this world of, of hobbits and, and dwarves and, and dragons. Um, in Middle Earth and, and being along on this adventure. And there was something about that, that I, I just, I devoured that book. And after that went looking for others like it. And they were, you know, the Lloyd Alexander's books and C.S. Lewis and Ursula K. Le Guin um, were, were all really important. And all, you know, I can definitely remember um, staying up. Well, being at the Highland Beach, um, it's a historically um, African American beach community that my my stepfather had a house in. It's in Highland Beach, um, and I read um, *A Horse and His Boy* in front of a big fan, just 
you know, all through the night. Um, and I don't know, there was basically I'm saying that those experiences um, broke through um, and made me a lover of reading and, and of wanting to write. And that, you know, that just grew from there. So in many ways, my, my really deciding to get into this book and, and to make it a series was is kind of paying tribute to to that, um, acknowledging that some of the most important books people can write are probably books that are read by kids and can be gateways to to other things um, for young people. So it's a long winded answer to say that um, it's all been a long a long process that maybe is going a little bit circular. Um, but yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I could see how you know you have a, a normal protagonist, normal, quote unquote, um, unspectacular, who then goes on their quest, their kind of hero's journey. Yes. Um, yeah, and I, I can see the influence. Sure. And also influences are, to some degree, you, you emulate them and in other, in other ways you respond to them. So, you know, I was, was a black kid um, reading Middle Earth, a world that, you know, wasn't including characters that um that looked like me nor did most of those other series um and i think as i entered into it i wanted to to change that dynamic um and to set this in in an ancient egypt kind of a, a black and brown world that it predates our our tragic racial history um where where you know kids that look like i used to and um and many other folks are are the protags, and they're there on the beautiful cover. Um, so that that was another thing that excited me about it, and excites me going forward with um, with the rest of the series. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Lindsay Howell asked uh, if I heard right, the section from Set's perspective is in third person, while Ash's perspective is told through first person. What factors led to that? Hmm. Um, well, you didn't, you did hear, hear correctly. Um, good observation. And that, that evolved initially the first draft, it was, it was all third person. And, you know, I definitely knew early that it was, they were mostly going to be, it's mostly going to be Ash's story, but that we would um, repeatedly return in, in short chapters to, to, to set as he in various kind of nefarious ways tries to sabotage things. Um, and he keeps at it throughout the whole book. Um, and I think it felt um, reasonable to keep set scenes in third person. Um, I wanted to you know, have that have, for the narrator to have access to his thoughts, but also to be critical of him, which I, you know, set would not have been to himself. Um, so there are a number of asides there where, where the, uh, that narrative voice is telling us not just what Set thinks, but what the narrator thinks about what Set thinks. So that's kind of fun. Um, but I do think that when I decided to try Ash in first person, that helped even out a lot of stuff for me. Um, I mean, I think even some of the early readers um, might felt like there was a, a disconnect potentially between the kind of ancient setting and the pretty modern sounding narrative voice I was using. And I wanted that. I did want it to feel um, you know, modern enough and for the voice to feel natural um, to today's young readers. And ultimately putting it in first person gave me the, the best access to kind of find Ash's voice and even that out and um, you know, access his, his doubts, his fears, his vulner vulnerability um, in the first person. And his, also, and his resilience um, and so many of the good qualities that, that he has and that um, he strengthens throughout this book. Um, it just felt more like, yep, yeah, this is Ash's story and he is ready, willing and capable to be narrating it. Um, and you can trust him. You can't trust Seth though. So he needs, he needs someone to, um, you know, to be a buffer um, <laughs> between his reality and the actual reality. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so I don't know if this goes along with kind of that question or not, but when you are writing for middle grade, a younger audience, are there different challenges 
than writing for an adult audience or do you come at it a different way or is it a completely right, different writing process or what are the differences there or similarities? Right. Um, a difference is that the writing process itself can be fun. Those big grown up books, um, you know, the whoppers about war and uh, and slavery and and the various things that, that I was writing, working on um, and exploring in the earlier books. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult material and the process of writing those books, I used to say, like, you know, if people ask me if I enjoyed writing, like, you know, do I get in, you know, in some zone and it's great. And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't really enjoy writing. I enjoy having written, like when, when something's accomplished and on the page and I can look at it and go, oh, I'm really glad I put those words down, but it wasn't fun. Um, with this book, I, I'm often having fun. Um, the, the humor is there no matter how much the, the apparent peril um, and, and deadly consequences of things are, 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 are informing everything. Um, there's always, you can always return to humor really quickly. Um, and in fact, you know, it's not nearly as deadly as um, the kids have been led to believe. Um, so there's that element too. But it's ultimately it's um, it's the appearance of lots of lots of peril that um, things things aren't quite what they seem, which you discover by the end. Um, so that fun is a big a big difference. Um, but it was quite challenging actually when I when I look at the the original draft, I can see that 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 third person voice um, was like tonally it wasn't quite um, it wasn't quite where where the book is now um, and there were some things that I was like I was still still very much learning to to speak to this audience and I, I hope I, I hope I've done that um, with the final book um, and also there were a lot more kind of editorial the editorial process was a lot more interactive. Um, mm. that, that was great. Um, a lot of back and forth, more than, than I've had with my previous editors really. And, and then different layers of, of it. Um, so kind of um, responding to um, sensi sensitivity readers um, who are just you know, looking for, um, for things that could be problems and um, representational issues and um, I really loved um, that process because that made the book um, better in lots of ways. And, and then other, um, because the book will, is hope, hopes to be a commercial book, but also hopefully an educational book, you know, at least lightly educational. Um, there was that layer of going, okay, you know, so solar power is a thing. Um, let's make sure that you use, you use that as much as possible and find different ways to, to make it exciting. And as an educational tool, let's find ways to actually, you know, yes, be fun and creative and, and kind of light with the ancient Egyptian setting, but also do, you know, ground some of it um, in, in, you know, in information that um, can also be used educationally. So thinking in those terms were, you know, a number of, of layers that I hadn't, you know, addressed quite quite so directly in the work before. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I love the the solar power <laughs> in this. It's just it's such a good idea, especially in Egypt. It's yeah. great. Oh. <laughs> we have another question from the audience um, from CJ Coke, who I think I believe is Chris Coke. <laughs> <laughs> um, they ask a lot of writing these days for younger readers is in first person. Do you think these readers are more open somehow to first person narratives? Yeah, I mean that that makes sense to me that. It, that it seems like one of the most natural things in the world is for someone to tell you a story. Um, and I think the combination of the directness of a first person address um, with hopefully having um, an identifiable um, narrator, um, protagonist, a, a friend <laughs> taking you on, on an adventure um, and maybe expressing and sharing some of both the, the fears and fears and doubts and the excitement um, and, and all of that 
seems really well suited to, to first person for, um, for younger readers. Yeah, yeah it, it almost just kind of feels instinctive even though it took me a little while to, to get around to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so as you were doing your research into Egyptian mythology and all of that, uh, did you come across a favorite god or demon or someone that you really wanted to make sure to get into the book or um like is there like one that you're like this is the best one this is my favorite i could write a whole book about this god um geez there there's there's so many and they have so, such unique traits and, and and personalities um at least the traits i i take off from their from their description and kind of bring to life i like them in different ways um uh, sometimes small ways, like there's um, a relatively, it's not one of the more famous gods, um, Maftet. Um, she's one of the, early in the book, she's she's one of the, the testing testing gods. Um, and, you know, she's kind of like, uh, you know, a mongoose. Um, <laughs> and I, my, my version of her was just that she was, um, you know, an amazing you know, fighter. And that's, that she oversees, um, some of the giant scorpion demon fighting um, that of course set makes go, go all, all awry. Um, and I don't know, I just really liked her and I, and you know, not a major God, but um, the notion that folks would have little um, like uh, you know, necklaces with, with Moftet as and other and snakes and stuff like that. Um, and so, so that the fact that some, some of the gods do big picture things like you know, you know creation and you know the sun and stuff like that, and others do very down to earth, um, uh, you know, kind of interactions or uh, very very real life um, um, aspects like you know, protecting um, you know, children, um, Tar Tar Waret and and Bess, um, uh, kind of a, a hippo god goddess and a, a sort of short stout kind of part lion um god who is very you know protective of children but also um is really kind of the life of life of the party as well and you know we like all things joy are are, are high on his list um i don't know it's like it's they're just really really quite distinct and mm. and then there's someone like isis who i, I respect in terms of the um her and antiquity and um, and the various stories from from long ago that are, are part of her life. I think Ash, you know, finds it amazing that some of those you know older gods, all the things they must have seen um, in you know age, ages gone past, and I don't know. So there's no one god. Um, it's it's just that I, I find them kind of an endless you know cast of potential characters, um, and and that's a lot of fun. Yeah. I always like in school learning about Egyptian mythology. Those were always like the most fun days. It was always the best stuff. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? Cool. <laughs> no, because I can't remember their names anymore. So I don't want to sound foolish, but um, yeah, I just remember like, it's just, just stark imagery where, you know, you have one God with like the head of a jackal and then like another one with like uh, the wings of an eagle or yeah. Yes. And so many of those are, there are multiple shape shifting, you know, like mm. it's not just the jackal. You can turn into a baboon, and, and you know, it's it's fun. <laughs> yeah, so very cool. Um, well, before we wrap up, um, when I talk to authors on the live stream, I do like to ask if you've been reading anything good, just anything at all that you would recommend to people recently. <laughs> if you've had time, I don't know. You know, you've just been like publishing a book and teaching and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um there it's things have been like mega mega busy um uh -huh. these days and um yeah some other some other things that are kind of in the in the tv world have been um taking up a good bit of my time too oh, definitely. Um, so i mean honestly it is it has become harder in recent in recent months to read much of anything that's not student work um mm -hmm. related to the other projects um, mm -hmm. but I mean, I can say that I kind of write in this middle grade space. I, I really, not recently, but I really loved a lot of Garth Nix, um, mm. middle grade work. Um, and 
the humor of the like the Septimus Heap books, um, I could have looked to, to, to a certain extent um, um, to them for inspiration. And Jonathan Stroud, um, with the Bartimaeus uh, trilogy, uh, that was that was a lot of fun too. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess I more recently, I mean, certainly. Um, Nadia Korafor um, is, is amazing, whether writing for young or, or, for, for, or for adults. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, a lot, a lot of the, the new diversity that has kind of bloomed um, in, the, in science fiction fantasy has been really exciting. Um, and there are lots of authors who are just bringing in um, lots of different, it's, it's still fantasy and still science fiction, but from different cultural pr perspectives, um, Rebecca Rowanhorse, um, been enjoying her stuff recently. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I would be jumping back into reading when the time when the time is there. Um, yes, when our brains kind of have the capacity to focus again. <laughs> yeah. <There's that. laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today, for taking time to come and read to us and share about your book. And once again, The Shadow Prince is available here in the store. It's available online. Look at that cover. Um, Eric it? Wilkerson, amazing, amazing artwork, I think. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. And this was the first time that I got to really interact with the artist. Um, you know, he, he sent me early, early um, you know, sketches and I could respond to them. And it was, it was actually, it was, it, was, it was even better than that. Um, where there were some things that he included um, in the artwork that I kind of looked at and went, hey, that's cool, but that wasn't in the book. I'm going to put it in the book. Um, <laughs> so it was like a back and forth going on there that um, was exciting. And, and I do know that he is attached to, to do the artwork for the next book too. That's great. Yeah. That's cool. That's very collaborative. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> well, great. Well, nice. Thank you so much. Everyone come pick up your book. Sorry, did I cut you off? Nope. nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sundance. And thanks, uh, folks who, who came out or, or tuned in. Yeah. Thank you Appreciate very much. It. And we'll see you all next time. Bye.